dimension, where reality is a relative term. The realm we occupy is only a minute portion of the infinite spaces that hold mysteries of the past, present, and future. The sheer vastness of our universe can be overwhelming. Danielle offers her hand as a guide into what we call the unknown. Travel with her as she endeavors to untangle the threads of not only our dimension, but of those beyond. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another show. We are here. It's April the 1st, and also happy Easter and blessing of the Lord for all of you guys that celebrate the Easter this weekend. I hope you're safe, happy, you know, and enjoying the spring and chippering of the bird that's coming all around. I am here, and together we're going to enter a diva's dimension with my amazing guest, with somebody who does do more research than anybody that i know that it's we can say bigfoot fanatic a researcher scientist uh recently has been traveling all around uh end up also on the museum uh basically front for the conference that's coming in april we're going to talk about that a little bit nobody else but one and only the duke welcome <laughs> hello duke and welcome i'm gonna put a little bit my curtain here because i'm beside the window and i think the sunlight is just we are getting really warm in here how are you today doing good thanks for the warm welcome and i wish i had a curtain so it didn't look like i was getting nuked in here but no <laughs> got two sliding glass doors right back there so there's no curtain you always have amazing humor and that's what i love and admire you uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this evening with me, I have a creator of, you know, uh, basically inventional finding the Bigfoot, Duke, WBC, Montana Bigfoot Project. Somebody that I admire as a researcher and somebody that I admire also as a friend. Uh, you know, it's my honor, Duke, to call you a friend, you know, and it's always honored to hear about your finding as everything that you dig around. Tell me what you've been up to these days. Uh, ridiculously busy. I was just on the Cryptid Wilderness show. Uh, I think mm -hmm. that came out yesterday. If you guys want to see it, the link's on my community tab on YouTube. Just a little short show, but we went over my first two encounters and then how I ended up getting involved in doing Bigfoot research to start with. So that took 45 minutes. And then um, also uh, I have my like you were mentioning, inevitably finding Bigfoot documentary that I need to get finished uh, here pretty quick because I'm going to have to be showing it at the end of the month at the Nebraska Bigfoot conference. Wow. And I was just actually working on more edits on it today because I had a couple of people that were working with me send me really better images of some of the stuff and the video clips I was working on mm -hmm. so I could go back and add them in and uh, make it make it even more obvious and clear what we're looking at, but of course that means that all the stuff that I already did, I have to tear it apart and re-edit everything. It's oh very my time God. consuming. Very, very time consuming. It just took me four hours to add in about a minute and a half of video. Oh my God. That's pretty long. And that's what we uh, love and admire about you, Duke. You know, I must say, ladies and gentlemen, whenever Duke sends me a picture or a video about the Bigfoot and his finding. I share it also with my family and with my friends. And nobody loves your pictures more than my mom, Duke. Because like, <laughs> oh, show me what did he see again? And then my sister goes like, oh my God. So we get really excited because we know, uh, you know, you are out there on the field looking out for them, you know, trying to share this, we can say, mystery that is becoming now and more and more real and reality to the world that bigfoot was always part of this world tell me a little yep. bit about you know uh the recent findings then you know uh, your little trip uh, basically to the area. well i haven't been out doing any field research yet because still winter here even though down in the valley it's nice and clear ground if you look up to where it's about four thousand feet there's snowpack so wow. <laughs> until that melts no research but, uh, you know, I look good in the reflected uh, glow of my many amazing guests that I have on my show. 
because even just because I can't get out and do anything doesn't mean they're not out there doing it. And they always build up enough evidence and a bunch of them are repeats. You know, they've been on my show several times and mm -hmm. like William Lunsford, it's yes. like every six months to a year, he's got enough evidence to come back on and do an update and show all the new stuff that he got and blame Tyler and some of these other people. And, um, this year we named uh, Robert Judd from Swan Lake Bigfoot Channel the field researcher of the year for 2023. Mm -hmm. And he is continuing to prove that he earned that title. And I was just saying to text backstage that he's got two videos he put out recently where it's uh, reflections in the sunglasses. And what was going on is he was hiking around, he had a camera, and he was talking and filming himself while he was hiking around. Going up to the top of this hill he hadn't been to before. Go hike up there, see what's going on. Film himself with the camera. Wow. Everything seemed pretty ordinary. And he got back home and he looked at the video. And the video of his face on the camera, you can see reflections of Bigfoot in his sunglasses. Wow. Several of them. One really huge and clearly no more than 15 feet away from him. He couldn't see them but his camera was picking him up in the reflection on his sunglasses. That's quite, uh, that's quite amazing. You know, uh, we know you've been always out there in a the field, you know, Montana is very similar to uh, basically Canada when it's coming, you know, uh, to the weather and to everything that is happening. But lately uh, I've been here really in a connection with my, uh, I can say with my Canadians in the prairies and they're kind of reporting to me that there's more seeing of the bread uh, of the Bigfoot prayer in the prairies uh, near more of the like a communities area that is more urban seeing the Bigfoot coming. What do you think about that? Why do we see them now getting closer and closer to the urban areas or to the areas where human lives? Are they trying to communicate with us? Is it because the spring is coming? What would be your professional answer? They move around seasonally to take advantage of local food supplies and places that humans are around, there tends to be available food like dumpsters and things like that too. And they know that, you know, wherever there's a food source that's reliable that they can get to, they'll take advantage of it. As far as them, being around suburban areas more. Yeah. I don't think it's a new thing. I just think that there's more people paying attention that are now spotting them. Mm -hmm. And where we went to uh, do the inevitably finding Bigfoot thing, this is in Nebraska. And when you think of Nebraska, the last thing you think of is a Bigfooty place. It's the Great Plains. There ain't nothing there. Cornfield, flat. How could there be Bigfoot there? Well, there are. Yes. Yes. They're, they're everywhere. Um, so you've kind of got the same thing going on there. You've got plains and then there's a bunch of little towns. And where we went to is actually the suburbs of the capital city of Nebraska, Lincoln. So this is a, a city. Yes. <laughs> and the suburbs around it, they spread out for miles. And in the middle of the suburbs, there's, uh, you know, some little wetlands where some creeks came through there that are too mm -hmm. low for them to be able to. Um, be able to build anything on because it's kind of a floodplain, and so they just left it as a nature area. And there's been Bigfoot reports uh, or evidence of them in that area since at least the 1950s. Wow, that's so. That's quite yeah, it, does, it doesn't it doesn't matter if there's humans around or not. They can figure, they can hide from us pretty effectively. Yeah, and uh, you know, I was surprised because uh, just by end of the today, I was talking to some researchers here in, in Canada, and they were asking me, "Oh, Daniel, you know, uh, would you like to be our guest, and we can talk about uh, you know the research here that it's happening in Canada?" And of course, of course, I said it would be uh, my pleasure, you know, to show what we are doing here. And then uh, I was also impressed by the reports that they're telling me you know because of them coming closer and closer to the prairies like here anybody has been around the prairies you're pretty flat we do have some valleys that we don't turn into the rockies jasper kootenai Kootenai, and further on but if you go saskatchewan and manitoba they're pretty flat especially saskatchewan yeah. so even we have the most uh car accidents there and the reason why when the drivers are going like these 
professional drivers that are big truck drivers for delivery, they say there's nothing to see. The scenery just fly basically with their eyes, everything being flat around, you know. So that's why sometimes, you know, people get tired, fall asleep, and the accidents happen more than anywhere in the, in Canada. So that would be the Saskatchewan. So when I hear that they're coming near the prairies and the areas that they cannot hide, I kind of wonder, is it possible that maybe we can expect more to come or maybe get more in contact than we ever been before? Well, they've always been there. I mean, there, you know, all the Great Plains states have reports of Bigfoot sightings. They're just not as frequent. And if you think about it, um, the only being built the way that they, they are and the way the lay of the land is, they're probably doing almost all their moving around after dark where you can't easily see them. Because if everything's flat for 20 miles and you got something 10 feet tall standing out there, you're going to see it for a long ways, right? Yeah. Okay, the other thing to keep in mind is that they're not necessarily hanging around where these areas are. All it takes for them to hide is a drainage ditch four feet deep. They yeah. can go down on all fours and you won't even be able to see them. And yeah. they do a lot of running around by doing, following those little depressions in the ground. And then the other thing is that in a lot of these plain states, like Nebraska actually has quite a few Bigfoot sightings in it. Mm -hmm. And again, you go, well, it's a great plain state. It's all flat with cornfields. Yes. Where are the Bigfoot hiding? Well, it's also got more river in it than almost any state in the country. Oh. And that's where they're hiding because they're right down by all the riverways where it's always riparian forest. And, you know, in this case, they've also got uh, limestone, everything there in Nebraska. So the waterways have all dug out along the banks and made these massive underground systems, karst systems. There's that massive natural caves in nebraska too so when they want to hide they got plenty of caves to go hide in <laughs> uh, and where I, are they I usually hanging that's... around right by the river where the caves are formed so true true yeah, you not know, very hard to figure out always friends for hiding even during the world war t two world war one well i'm mentioning world war three you never know i hope never but uh, we are kind of going down that path. Uh, talking about the, you know, our chats, I can see we are full. I want to say just for a moment, be kind. Gary Spikes, hello. Thank you for your support. Moon at noon, Johnny Temperane. Oh, my God. So many people here. KD7. Um, and thank you and welcome aboard. There's somebody new here. Uh, welcome aboard, everybody. I love that you guys. Uh, Michelle. Oh, my God. We have so many people in the chat. I don't want to. Uh, well, Brandon, welcome again. Ivan, welcome again. I'm trying. Uh, Glenn, wow. B, this is crazy today. I think you're quite popular, Duke. I think people love to hear your stories. And I'm also always checking the Instagram because a lot of times. And if you guys have a question for our guest uh, this evening, please. Put them in a capital letters, and it will be my pleasure, uh, of course, to share it. And then uh, Duke, with his professional expertise, will try his hardest to give us the answer. Duke, tell me a little bit about that conference that is happening in April, if you don't mind. Yeah, this will be the third time I've been to the Nebraska Bigfoot Conference, which uh, this time they're actually having it in Grand Island, Nebraska. It has been in Hastings the last few years, which is the home base of the Nebraska Bigfoot Museum or the Mid-America Bigfoot Museum, as it's also called. But they needed a bigger vanguard, so now they're moving it to Grand Island, which is about 15 miles away, and it's going to be at their brand new, one of their brand new buildings at the state fairground, actually. So you got a much bigger facility, and in order to show video clips or movies or anything like that, you don't have to go to a separate venue for it. Because yes. the theater and all the sound system for it and everything is built right into the stage. So that makes it handy. And then the uh, first day, we've got a whole ton of speakers. And at the end of the day, there's going to be two movies, uh, Flash of Beauty Part 2. And sorry, I can't think of the name of the other one. It's like Al McGargle <laughs> and a couple of his buddies that do documentaries. Like every year, they show up with a new documentary. And they're always really cool. And But that's a separate fee to see those. And then uh, if you get the ticket for Saturday, you get to see all the speakers on Saturday, which would include, um, I'm not sure, 
the whole lineup, but for sure, Robin McRae, oh, uh, nice. Blaine Tyler, uh, Robert Kreider, and myself. Uh, Yay. Again, I can't well. And, and I'm uh, apparently I'm the headliner. I get to go last. So I'm like Black Sabbath when all the other bands get done warming up the audience and get done. <laughs> so anyway, the main it's not that I'm that popular. The main reason that I went last is because instead of doing my presentation this year i'm going to be showing my documentary and so we had to do yes. it last so we could show the documentary and then we're going to have all the cast members on stage doing a live q a for the audience that gets to be the first people to see it and that's quite amazing uh ladies and gentlemen so if you can attend that conference uh you know that is coming in april it will be quite fantastic there'll be many wonderful speakers there and just like duke is saying you guys will also hear and uh, see his presentation. I also did see on the front page and that uh, was quite amazing. I was impressed because I'm always happy to see that people are being uh, recognized, uh, basically. Prospecting USA, welcome, Pixie, Ponch, Zorch, uh, Rocking Rory. Oh my God, you guys, welcome everybody. Yes, and happy Easter, happy Easter to everybody. I must say, uh, Duke, whenever- Hold on, I'm hold on a second. Yes. Hey. You guys click the like button for Danielle. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Yes, you guys, if you like the show, please give us the thumbs up. And, you know, and that's really more than enough because that will keep the lights going on and we'll continue uh, bringing up fantastic guests. And I'm quite uh, happy, Duke, you know, to say that, you know, your research is always giving us a new insights about the things that are happening out there. So I was just wondering, you know, uh, lately you've been showing some uh, basically uh, pictures on your, of course, uh, podcast and your videos. So what I uh, want to do, I will show a couple of the pictures and maybe if you uh, want, uh, then you can uh, explain to us a little bit about what these picture mean and where did you uh, got it? So I'm gonna show this one because it's quite amazing. So can you tell us a little bit about that photo? Wow. Yeah, if you want to see the close up of this uh, video in excruciating detail, Kelly Shaw from Rocky Mountain Sasquatch Organization just turned it out uh, yesterday, where mm -hmm. he takes the video clip, zooms in on it a lot, runs it back and forth so you can see it, and that's the. That's the youngster that was sitting in the uh, pile of fallen trees about 15 feet in front of me watching me. And you can see his face wow. there. You can see his fingers. Where's the other picture where you got everything outlined? I'm going to try it so let's see this one. Nope. Let me see if he, he didn't download the other one that I sent him. So I'll just. Uh, so what is this one? What I sent him the other one? That well, I was hoping to be able to show you guys the clip from the teaser trailer so that I could uh, explain to you what this thing is. But without that, it's not going to make much sense. This yes. is a closer zoomed in version of the Bigfoot that appears right at the beginning of the teaser trailer. And uh, that's another thing. Uh, I was trying to uh, download that video. So if you guys uh, would like to see that video, it's quite amazing. But we couldn't. Even text was trying. There was probably some issues because, of course, it's your own video. So that's probably why we couldn't download it. So hey, Brandon, we, it's so blurry because it's been zoomed in as far as it can possibly go and still see yes. it. So they don't please, stand right uh, next to you usually. Yeah, please check out uh, the uh, videos and uh, basically Duke's uh, channel. And you'll be capable of seeing some of the amazing stories there. I do follow his channel. Like I'm saying, I'm a friend and a follower too and a supporter of his wonderful work. Tell me, you know, lately you had uh, some of the great brains there, like Dr. Kelly. I know she was there with you. Can you tell us a little bit about that research and that project that you did on your podcast about it? Uh, who are you talking about? Uh, Kelly. Kelly Shaw. Lost your audio. Yes, Kelly Shaw. Yeah. Yeah, Kelly I have on once a year. He doesn't do shows anymore. He used to do TV shows and everything else, and he got sick of them because mm -hmm. being poorly treated and them putting out oh. malarkey. 
And that's the problem with TV shows. They have a script. It's all garbage. You don't believe anything they put out there. Um, so, yeah, Kelly, uh, he, he pretty much quit doing that stuff. He just does his own channel and, you know, he doesn't need TV anyway. He's got 100,000 subs on his YouTube channel. Wow. But uh, he uh, comes on my channel once a year and does some updates and gives everybody behind the scenes on all the interesting stuff that happened to him during the previous year. So, and one of the things that happened during the previous year, this year was he came up here with Jenny and they went out to one of my Bigfoot areas for about six hours and got a couple of Bigfoot on video mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. they got a bunch of whoops and they got two track lines of 19 inch craters, <laughs> tracks, <laughs> 19 inch craters, <laughs> where one was going up and down an embankment and leaving craters. So they had all kinds of fun. So that was, uh, again, you know, getting to work yes. with Kelly. And, and now uh, when I get something that, because I don't have the best uh, software, I, you know, like w w no funding. So I have to make a do with whatever I can actually get my hands on. And, uh, you know, the, um, some of the software, like Kelly's got way better Zoom software than I do. He can go up to 400%. Yes. The only limit with that is if you film things digitally, if you zoom in too far, it just pixelates, turns blurry. Oh. So wow, there's a little, that's, that's yeah, that's why digital is just horseshit as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> Patterson Gimlin Patty was filmed on uh, film, not digital. Yes. That's yes. why you can zoom in infinitely far on that and get mm -hmm. all that detail. You can't do that with digital. You'd never be able to do it with digital. And so. I have a I have a one question here that I just uh, pulled by from Instagram. So this is Ivan. Ivan is one. So hello to all the viewers in Croatia. I have people from all around following me, Duke. Uh, and his question is, hello to your wonderful guest. I would like to know, would Bigfoot attack people or children if they're provoked? That's kind of like asking, would humans attack if they're provoked <laughs> it totally depends on the situation it depends on the individual in wow. general they're pretty passive and they don't like you know causing trouble or anything so um again this is why there's it, we need more education to the general public that they exist and what to do or what not to do so that you don't piss them off mm -hmm. um but generally they're shy and reclusive and they don't want anything to do with you and most of the time mm -hmm. people have issues with them. There's been some kind of an aggression on behalf of the human, yes. whether it was knowing or inadvertent. And that's why they react to it. And their, their idea of aggression could be anything like who's this jabroni that just moved in here, cut down all the trees and build a house, get out. <laughs> <laughs> Timothy. So Timothy from New Jersey is saying hello to your wonderful guest. My simple question would be, are the Bigfoot inner dimensionals or out dimensionals? So are they coming from different dimensions or they're inside of our dimension? They're from right here, but when they uh, get older and get the proper training, apparently some of them can pierce the veil. Oh. So they don't have to be here. And when they're on the other side of the veil, there is apparently no time over there. Mm -hmm. so time is mm -hmm. not flowing. So some of them can reach tremendously long ages by just not being here very much. The more they're here, the more that they're aging at the same speed the rest of us are. Mm -hmm. And their average lifespan, if they were to stay here the whole time, is still greater than ours is. They probably average around 120, 140 years. Okay. If you guys uh, need uh, uh, to ask a question or a wonderful guest, please do post it here on the YouTube. I'll be capable to see it. I also have an Instagram. So on Instagram, I can see... Uh, your questions if you guys so I have a uh, one more question and this one is from Michael and Michael is asking hello from Toronto and my question would be when is the mating season of the Bigfoot good question I think it depends on where you are exactly and that will determine a lot about when they want to give birth to infants um, William seems to think that down there where he is which would be the Falk area that they're actually giving birth um, the beginning of December. And our wow. best guess at the gestation period is about 10 months, so extrapolate from there. But it's a lot warmer down there than it is up here. So do they want to have babies in the middle of the winter? The ones up here might not give birth until the spring when it's a little bit warmer and easier to keep them alive. Wow. Thanks, Jason. That's, 
Yeah, that's quite. Uh, thank you, Jason. You know, we have so many viewers in here. Uh, like Brandon is saying, it's a full house. And hello to everybody that is just joining in. Please, we do have a wonderful, uh, basically great Duke here. If you guys have a question for an expert of a Bigfoot and somebody who has a, so much knowledge in this, school, in this field, I have one and only uh, Duke here with us. I have a, one question for you. You know, Many people, uh, you know, when it's coming to talking about the Bigfoot, they are talking that, you know, these creatures have been part of this world for already quite a while. And I also believe in that. What, what do you think? How long they've been here? They've been here before of us or, you know, during evolution time or when did they join the Mother Earth? According to the DNA research that Dr. Melba Ketchum is doing, they date back to about 15,000 years ago, which is when they hybridized with humans. And that's the all the DNA that she's getting right now are all hybrids. She had like over 100 samples, and they're all coming out to be the same thing, which is mitochondrial DNA, human female, nuclear DNA, male, in other words, unknown. Doesn't match up to anything. Doesn't match up to Neanderthal. Doesn't match up to Gigantopithecus. Knock it off, Meldrum. Mm -hmm. They're wrong. They're hybrids. They're half human, half something else. We don't know what that something else is. So the real question is, are there still any of those something else's that aren't hybridized running around? And what are they? And then the other question is, how much longer were they present before the hybridization occurred? Well, it could have been hundreds of thousands of years. It could have been millions of years. We don't know. All we know is the current Sasquatch mm -hmm. in North America, according to the DNA evidence, is coming out as a hybrid. Wow. Between and human, and, human yeah. and something else. That's all we know. And that, that and apparently, know. and you can tell that from the DNA, how long ago it happened. And, you know, again, that was somewhere between twelve and 15,000 years ago. So wow. right at the uh, uh, tail end of the last ice age, basically. Uh, and, and that's quite amazing. You know, Brandon is sharing something. He said they're similar to bears. I woke up on a massive bear and he didn't attack me. I also had the bears come around my cabin uh, that were not friendly. So, of course, you know, uh, what do you think about, and thank you, Brandon, and everybody else, please do share your questions. I have Instagram here on and on the YouTube. And, of course, we have Gary here to back us up. Uh, so we'll do our best to answer your questions. I have a question for you. How many times do you think people are tricked, we can say, by the eye, you know, and thinking maybe this, this is a bear, but it actually was a Bigfoot. Uh, and they say, oh, this is a bear. Uh, but it was I think it happens a lot because most people don't believe Bigfoot's out there. And when they do see something gigantic and it's not on two legs and it's covered with hair, well, it must be a bear. And the fact of the matter is that Bigfoot run around on all fours as well as on bipedally. And when they want to, you know, duck down into the cover, so they're not standing up above the little shrubs they're walking around in, they just drop down to all fours. Now they're only five feet at the shoulder or six feet at the shoulder. They're not 10 or 12 feet tall. It makes it a lot easier to hide. And they can run just as fast, if not faster, on all fours that they can on, you know, just two legs. So I think a lot of people that just get a casual glance of one darting through the woods on all fours, their brain will just go, well, it's a bear. What else could it be? Wow. You know, uh, I love that you're sharing that. So ladies and gentlemen, please do pay attention because there's more and more sighting of a Bigfoot all around the world, you know, uh, that maybe pay attention that it's not a bear because it could be something else. I know, Duke, you also... I know Bigfoot is your expertise, but you do a lot of research on the dogman too. So little Patty here, he said, Duke, your opinion, do female dogmen have a single bird or a litter? I have no information on that whatsoever, but the next time I get a chance to talk to a dogman, I'll ask him. Wow. Yeah. You know, did you, uh, so now I know it's a little bit off the topic of a Bigfoot. Did you ever encounter a dogman, Duke? Or maybe yes. you did. Yes. yes. Yeah. No. Well, I, you know, I haven't seen a dogman with my naked eye. I have gotten them on camera more than once, and then finding them 
in the video afterwards. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they hang around to the Bigfoot too. Both the, my main research areas, the groups of Bigfoot that live there apparently have dogmen hanging around with them because both groups I've managed to get shots where there's been more than one Bigfoot that I could get on the video at the same time. And, um, uh, one of them, there was one that was like literally standing in between two Bigfoot peeking around a tree, looking at me. You can see the dog like head. It's like, obviously not a Bigfoot. And then the other one, uh, I was just panning around camp. It was almost dark and I was at location B mm -hmm. and, um, we just set up camp and I'm like, okay, here's the layout for camp going on panning around. And actually the spot where this thing was standing, I panned across it a couple of times, even though I didn't notice it was there. And then Robin went back and saw it afterwards and went, Hey, there's a dog man standing right over there. Like maybe 40, 50 feet away from you guys, just standing in between a couple of trees, watching you set up camp. Okay. Wow. <laughs> Good thing I accidentally went across it a few times with the camera. So you could make sure that, yeah, that's exactly what was standing there. So that was creepy. So, and again, you know, just because you get them on video doesn't mean you're going to see them with your naked eye. And that's part of the problem because they can seem how, I don't know how they do it, but they can cloak to your naked eye and your camera can still pick them up. And this is what, again, going back to uh, Robert at Swan Lake Bigfoot, where he's walking around filming himself and he's got these wraparound sunglasses and you can see the reflection of the Bigfoot in front of him wow. in the sunglass, but he can't see it. I mean, they're like, they could reach out and touch them. They're that close, but he wow. can't see them. And that's, that's quite amazing. So, uh, it's quite creepy. <laughs> it's yes. very creepy. Uh, what kind of camera do we use? We do have Fuji and I must say, uh, my sister is an expert at taking pictures. So when there's some pictures that need to be done, uh, she's the one who is in charge of that. She's also amateur photographer so when you guys see the pictures that are taken from jasper or around uh she's pretty good with that so that's her strength uh what kind of camera do you use uh or somebody in your team does use uh duke oh, i have like a 10 year old sony camcorder it's nothing special <laughs> but you know as long and this is the thing you can have the best camera if you don't know how to take a picture or if you don't know how to call that or, you know, invoke them, then it yep. won't happen. Um, That's a sad have... fact is most of the uh, big budget, big name researchers out there, you could give them a million dollars worth of camera gear and they're still never going to find anything to film. And most of the guys that can actually find them regularly have a budget of nothing. So you get these crappy videos. It looks like they took it with a potato with a lens on it. Well, what do you expect? They got no budget. <laughs> this isn't exactly. a Hollywood movie production company. Do you know what those movie cameras that they use cost? The low end oh, ones are fifty thousand dollars. Oh yes, oh yes, yeah. they're pretty. No, no uh, pretty uh, researcher out there that's doing this out of their own pocket has a fifty thousand dollar camera they're no. walking around. Yes. With. And, you know, I just did an interview and I'll be in documentary of Jeremy Nori. And I did see him when he does do the stuff. He carries all these expensive cameras and everything. And he said, I'm a movie producer, but all everything that I do, I actually uh, pay by myself. So I must say, you know, uh, like you're saying, it takes a uh, lot of time, a uh, lot of, uh, you know, courage fundraising and everything because those things are really really uh expensive but that's when most of the research is coming up so i just have a one more pop-up here from the uh basically instagram and it's coming from valentina so valentina is saying hello from zagreb that's a capital city of croatia and she's saying hello danielle and hello to your lovely guest i have a question there is there a big foot in europe Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, if you would have been able to cue it up to show it, the video that uh, Kelly Shaw just did of the breakdown on my Bigfoot in a brush pile 15 feet in front of me, mm -hmm, he compared mm -hmm. to a, a screen capture from a video of Survivor Man where Les yeah. Stroud was in Romania, Transylvania exactly, to be precise, almost slid off a mountain and got killed. And while he's filming himself, there's a Bigfoot in the background about 20 feet away from him watching him. And, and the face on that Bigfoot looked a lot like the one that I just got in the brush pile 15 feet in front of me. So, yes, in uh, Germany, they're called the uh, uh, Der Wildermann. 
And, you know, in Britain, it's the wood woes and all over Europe, there's different yeah. names for them. Yeah. So, yeah. yep, they're, they're known. People there just don't acknowledge they exist anymore. And Bigfoot in Germany, Robert Boston used to be just amazed when he was over there. He's an American. And he mm -hmm. lived over there for a while, was doing Bigfoot research in Germany. And he was always amazed at how none of the Germans ever go off the trail, ever, ever. Oh. The Bigfoot could set up a tree structure 50 feet off the trail and no one will ever see it because they don't walk off the trails. And Americans don't get that. They're like, oh, a trail is like, you know, a suggestion. I feel like walking that way. I'm going yeah. that way. <laughs> yes. So consequently, uh, first of all, there's not a whole lot of them that are doing the woodsman thing anymore. And uh, just to tell you guys, I can see Freaky D, please. Yes. Please do post your questions. I can see Freaky Geek. Yeah, I try to answer uh, the questions the best I can. You guys post them in the big letters, and then I'll try my hardest to share them with uh, our uh, guest. Um, another thing that I, I wanted to say, you know, this is not going to be the last time and to uh, download that video, our hardest, so we can have it there and show you the video. Uh, and then there is Pont Zorge that is asking, could you fly a drone while holding up uh, to do like a basically digital skinning? Is that possible? Uh, we got drone video on my documentary and while well, we were running around doing field research last year. So go to my channel, watch it. Mm -hmm. And all of the, the, the drone so video, all the drone video is digital. Mm -hmm. There is no such thing as film mm -hmm. drone. <laughs> <laughs> and uh another another uh question you know that you know i see popping on the boat side please tell us you know when people are going for this research and study what do you need to have with you how do you prepare to get there and go on this adventure finding a bigfoot well, I'll tell you what, if you see any researchers with their channels and they find a Bigfoot track and they don't immediately put a tape measure down next to it and measure it, that's not a real researcher and they don't know what the hell they're doing. <laughs> Seriously. They ain't putting a tape measure down and measuring that track right away. They don't know what the hell they're doing. That just tells me that they never find tracks and they're not prepared for it. Most okay. of the tracks that you find are not castable. So carrying casting material around with you mm -hmm. is pointless. If you find one that's castable, go buy some casting material. If it's going to rain, throw a box over it until you get back. You don't need that. Wasting your time carrying it around. If you can find the track once, you can find it again. Go get casting material, come back and cast it. The best thing you can do is get some good video of it with a tape measure on it. So we have an idea of what the scale is, you know, and honestly, the only thing scientifically you can get from a track anyway is if there's dermal ridges on it. So unless you've got some perfect track that's in the mud where it actually left dermal ridges, it's just a vanity thing. If you bother to cast it, you're not getting any scientific data out of it. It's just like you got a trophy. And I found hundreds of tracks and I have zero track casts. I don't care. The only update there's been on anything like this recently that's actually worth paying attention to is they now have an app for your cell phone. If you got one of these fancy ones that's got multiple camera lenses on it, they've got an app that can LiDAR map a track, which gives you a 3D representation of the track in digital. So you can wow. look at it from any side. You can look at it from the side underground. You can look at it from below looking up to see what the bottom of the track looks like. And if there is, in fact, any dermal ridges there, then it's worth casting. <laughs> wow. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, and also another thing that, you know, uh, many people are asking, you know, regarding what was your biggest foot friend that you found? Uh, we just showed that in Sunday's video. Uh, Mm -hmm. 31 plus inches. We don't know exactly how long it was because it poured rain the night before, so it washed out the end of the toe impressions. Wow. But at 31 least 31 in inches. Yeah. 31 inches, big foot, ladies and gentlemen. Just imagine that giant standing on a 31 inch foot. 
you know, we go size 11 or size 12 or 14, the basketball players, we say, oh, my God, these guys are tall. Just imagine how massive that creature is. Uh, what would be the biggest? I'm not sure that was even a Bigfoot, honestly, because the proportion of the track was wrong. The mm -hmm. width was too thin, and it was proportioned like a human foot. So mm -hmm. it might have been a giant track. If it was mm -hmm. a giant track, it's easy to scale up from the proportion of the foot, and it'll yield you a 16.5 foot tall giant. We have a question here for Brendan. He said, I wonder if you could put a film camera on a drone and put a mechanical level on the drone that is engaged with remote that pushes it on the shutter body. What do you think? Would that work? A, find a film camera. <laughs> <laughs> How many film video I cameras guess. are still around? And then B, you're going to have to have yourself one really big drone to carry that weight because those things aren't light. Okay. Glenn has a question. 31 inches. How tall would that be? Like if that's no, like I just said, 16 and a half feet tall. 16 and a half feet tall. Oh my God, gentlemen. And la ladies and gentlemen, forgive me. 16 and a half foot tall. Oh my God. And I'm only 5'4". So yep. you know, if you saw my it. show on Sunday, you see that we put out an entirely new measurement system now. For the, it, yeah, it, it's it, another add-on for the imperial system. Now we have yeah. inches, feet, yards, and gimlins because we had a <laughs> Bigfoot sighting where the gim uh, Bigfoot was standing right next to a full-size uh, plywood cutout of Bob Gimlin. So wow. we just scaled it up. How tall was it in comparison to Bob Gimlin? And it turns out it was just over two gimlins. So that's now a standard unit of measurement in Bigfooting, gimlins. That's amazing. Yeah, That's Gimlin's amazing. just over five feet. I think it's like five two, five three. I'm not sure exactly how tall Bob is, but tall doesn't really apply to descriptions of Bob. So, and we have a really amazing person to join us uh, today. That's Josh Tarner. Welcome, hey, Josh. Uh, U.S. Dimension, uh, dear friend. Uh, this place is always open to the friends uh, and to the people that are researchers diggers for the truth and the answers welcome aboard dear friend uh i have another question uh for you uh my dear friend you know many people are saying well what i can do you know to call these creatures to come to me or if i if i want to do something what do i bring do i bring meat do i bring popcorn i'm just making a joke do i bring apples what the big food like as a as a lure or we can say as a bait so we can well see that. let's get let's get away from all of the ridiculous nonsense that was pushed on everybody from that finding bigfoot show yes yes and mountain monsters and some other shows don't call blast don't make calls don't do wood knocks the mm -hmm. majority of the time they can tell it's a stupid human doing a bad imitation and they're just going to go further away <laughs> The other option is that you'll like fool a teenager or some youngster and they'll come over and show up and then realize they've been tricked and they will not be happy about it. And another option is that you will piss off the adults because they can hear that you're a human trying to do these calls and they might decide to come and cause some trouble for you before they leave and have nothing to do with you. So my best advice is if you want to go to an area where there's actually Sasquatch activity and maybe have something happen. Just act like you have no interest in Bigfoot whatsoever. You're going there to go camping. You're going there to have fun with your friends. You're going to have a campfire. You're going to tell stories, sing around the campfire, play your you know lousy acoustic guitar out of tune and sing off key, all that kind of stuff that everybody does around campfires. Uh, maybe not including drinking and making a mess. If you're making a racket and you're making a big mess, they're not going to like that. This is their mm -hmm. living room. You know, go walk into somebody's living room unannounced and barf on their floor and set up a game camp. This does not make the locals happy. So it's basically common sense. Just think of the woods as their living room. If someone was in your living room, how would you want them to act? Exactly. And if, you know, you may have to go back to the same place multiple times, dozens of times for years before you actually see or hear any actual activity. Mm -hmm. That's totally up to them. And in a lot of cases, they, the vast majority of cases, 
They really want absolutely nothing to do with us. They don't trust mm -hmm. us. We're dangerous and crazy, inscrutable and unreliable. And they just want to stay safely away from us. So if you can get them to actually interact with you or anything, it's first of all, they like you. And secondly, they feel like interacting with you. And just because you, you keep going back to a place that's a Bigfoot hotspot, you can keep going back there for the rest of your life. And if they don't like you, you're still not going to get anything. Wow. Eve here is asking, I always hear jerky. Is that good? Well, any kind of meat, they like that. They're omnivores like we are. And being that they're also great apes like we are, they favor sweets. They like sweet snacks. And don't make it a habit to give them processed sugar because they don't have a dentist. And when their teeth fall out, they're going to be very unhappy. And they might take it out on you. <laughs> I love this comment by Rags. Feed them once. They could fall on your home. Could you afford to feed the entire clan of them? Yeah, <laughs> so exactly. How much meat do we need? <laughs> no, uh, Rags is exactly right. And you should never interact on that level with the ones that are anywhere near you and rich soul and blaine tyler and a few other people could tell you that because they tried it and they followed them home and those guys weren't all that you know irritated by it or disturbed or anything but their wife and kids sure were they didn't want bigfoot hanging around peeking in the windows tapping on the house in the middle of the night so if you're going to do any kind of gifting or anything try and do it with a group that's much further away from where you live and don't try and be their regular food source you can't feed them. You couldn't even afford to feed one of them. So whatever you're giving them doesn't amount to food. It amounts to a snack. And it's better to not get them thinking you're, they're going to get a snack from you every day or every week. I love this uh, question from Alexei. So Alexei is here from Edmonton. Hello, Alexei. And he has a question. So the question is saying, hello to a great Duke here from Prairies. I have a question. How much meat does adult Bigfoot eat? Depends on how big they are. Mm -hmm. I know um, Kevin, when he was hanging around with Glag, and Glag was only about eight feet tall then, and he reported that in one sitting, they had, he had made a campfire and he was roasting part of a piece of a deer for him to eat, and Glag tore off one of the hind quarters, ripped the hide off it, and just ate it while he was waiting for more of it to cook. Wow. So he ate an entire hindquarter of a deer by himself easily. And then, then he was waiting for more of it to cook so he could have the yummier tasting cooked venison. Um, but, you know, how much can they eat? They can eat a ridiculous amount. Let's just say that. Wow. And, and that's it. Thank you, Kat. There's a wonderful uh, comment say, the great Bigfoot researcher, that's you, Duke. Miss Kevin, thank you so much. You all do great work together. That's why we have them here, Kat, because we want them to share their knowledge, their wisdom here with all of us so we can learn from them. And thank you. We have a full house tonight. Oh, my God. Thank you all guys to join. And just to let you know, we'll have a Duke here back again. I have a, a one more uh, uh, question, if you don't mind, uh, Duke. Tell me a little bit more. You know, the spring is coming. The warm weather is coming. Uh, people will go more into the woods and wilderness and everything. What would be the best way or where we should kind of go if we would like to see them or kind of try to encounter the Bigfoot? Well, again, this requires scoping out an area that they might be actually regularly hanging around with uh, in mm -hmm. because there's some areas where, you know, you can have a random sighting because they're just walking through the area. That doesn't mean you're going to see one there again. So first problem is to figure out where they're actually hanging around. And mm -hmm. one of the things you could do is look at the databases where all the reports have been. Or you can watch Rocky Mountain Sasquatch Organization with Kelly Shaw. Because whenever there's a cluster of sighting reports, he'll show up at, at some point and cover most of them. And if it happens to be anywhere near where you're at, you can go, hey, there was a cluster of sighting reports over there. That's wow. a good place to go look and see if I can find one. And then after that, it's all, um, you know, do you know what tree structures look like? Do you know how to track? <laughs> Actually, if you get experienced enough, uh, people like uh, Baron Kunbo from the Bigfoot Outlaws and myself and a few other people, you can just look at a topographical map and go, well, they're probably right here, and then go oh. look for them. And it doesn't matter if there's been any sightings from there or not. As a matter of fact, it's preferable if you can do it that way, because if there hasn't been any sightings from there, 
that means no one else is going to be looking at that area thinking mm -hmm. there's Bigfoot there and you won't be having interference by curious, not very good Bigfoot researchers doing dumb things. You know, you were mentioning something that is very uh, close to my heart because I had the encounter myself and I'm still digging for it. Like I was saying, I wasn't looking for it. And you know about it. I was going for That's it. usually when it happens. You're, you know, yeah, I was if you're out for looking it. for them, they know it. So they even try to hide harder, yeah. you know. And that's that's how it happened. You know, I encountered uh, the creature, you know, I reported it. And I said I wasn't the only one. So here in Canada, we have a little bit different approach when it's coming to unknown especially to our uh national parks our rangers will tell you oh, you know what there's many things out there that we don't even know what it is so you know the first one or the last one probably that report maybe there's a lizard man there is a dog man bigfoot or something like that so yeah. you know i have one more question before i i let you go and i love this question because we have Suzanne here and Suzanne is saying hello to your great guest. I love your show, Daniel. Thank you very much. And the question would be, is UFO connected to Bigfoot? Uh, there's some people that seem to think that they're connected. I don't really see the connection. Um, you know, Robin McCray would probably be a better person to talk to about that one. As far as I can see, you know, after over 40 years of field research, um, I've been in a lot of areas with heavy Bigfoot presence, and I've never seen a UFO got anywhere near the ground in any of those areas with all the Bigfoot there. And Robin will tell you that the majority of the time, if the uh, uh, star people uh, show mm -hmm. up, the Bigfoot run the opposite direction because they don't like them or trust them. There's one uh, group of those guys, apparently, that are on the page that they think the Sasquatch should be doing all their spying for them. The Sasquatch begs to differ. So they're trying to um, force their will upon them, which does not work out well. And when you try and piss off somebody that's 14 feet tall, they might decide to just step on you, and that does happen. Wow. So, no, I don't, I don't see it. I mean, according to what I've heard, there's like one group of them that are working with the aliens, but uh, other information I've got on that is that basically they might just be like traders in fifth column. That are selling their own people down the road working with these little alien creeps wow, so that's, that's about all i've heard about that one but from what i've been able to gather they're not working together they're not on good terms mm -hmm. before i let you go duke you know our video goes just like that so i'm i'm pretty happy you know ladies and gentlemen this is not going to be the last time that i have my amazing friend here uh sharing his stories and his research please don't miss the conference that it's coming in june uh the big alabama conference is coming the tickets will be on sale at the door for 35 dollars if you get them online if they're ready for 35. we have many different kind of uh shows on texas front porch so please do check uh each and every one of them uh, you know, we have uh, Booze and Bones, we have uh, BMR, what is great, uh, wonderful Robert, I really do love him. We have Donnie Cho, Cecil, uh, you know, we have Tin Foils, I think. Uh, there's many different ones out there. Uh, all these shows are there for you guys to give you more information, more insights about the mysteries and what's out there. Um, again, before I let you go, Duke, tell me, where the people can find you, how they can contact you, and see your wonderful research. Well, you can find me on YouTube, Rumble, BitChute, and Odyssey. Uh, my contact information is in the show notes on every video. You can contact me on Yahoo, World Bigfoot Central at yahoo.com. I also have a group, uh, World Bigfoot uh, Central, on youtube and or excuse me uh facebook and the only reason that that group is there is for people that want to actually get notified that my show is coming out because youtube has this bad habit of not bothering to do that mm -hmm. uh so and i'm also on x uh formerly twitter come on over there friend me hang out share hilarious Bigfoot memes. Kelly Shaw's over there posting hilarious Bigfoot memes all the time. <laughs> and both of us post updates on if we got something new coming out. There it is. So you don't miss it because YouTube didn't tell you. I've also got uh, World Bigfoot Central on the MeWe platform, which is like yes. Facebook, except does not censor you. 
and so a mi million times better than Facebook or fascist book, as I like to call it. I'm not even on fascist book. I got a group on fascist book that's called Montana Bigfoot Project. It's got 6,000 members. You can go on over there and join that one if you want, but don't expect to talk to me because I'm not on Facebook. My mods are running that group and posting video and stuff to it. Um, so other than that, I think that pretty much covers most of the where you can contact Duke stuff. Again, contact info for email and everything is in the show notes on all my videos. And again, Duke, uh, thank you very much for joining us this evening. Like I'm saying, this was a blast and we'll have you here uh, back again. Please do stay tuned in for Texas Front Porch. You'll have Texan Brandy, my wonderful friends, taking you further into discussion and to different topics as the evening goes on. Again, Duke, thank you very much. God bless you. Continue, guys, this festive season. Have a wonderful Easter uh, basically Monday and enjoy the evening. God bless. Have a great day, my friend. Thank you very much. Don't hug the Wookiees. Thank you. <laughs>